then I usually say this, I need for some of you to come home and talk to my wife. Because you obviously think I am somebody. You love me, Robert! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my wife thinks I'm somebody too. I'm the one that takes the trash out. <laughs> no, we've been married uh, for 39 years uh, this year. So. August of what now 2017 will be will be 40 mm -hmm. and so we have a uh, we have a uh, I was informed that we must go on an, an, on, on an Alaskan cruise <laughs> so that's what we'll be doing on our 40th anniversary actually on the on the date of the 40th anniversary I will be with Patricia King I think in, in Europe so prior to that we'll be on the on the Alaskan cruise you see I have a great watch she said yeah 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 go, go do your tour in Europe uh, and so I will do that. I think on my, uh, I think was it our 25th anniversary? I was in Israel with Benny Hinn. <laughs> so, so um, she's been real, really, really, you know, flexible. <laughs> so anyway, it's really great to be back here with you guys. Thank you so much for uh, having us here. Uh, I heard uh, Pastor Rob say that Beverly. That she was come and going to come and didn't want to speak and I said oh, I, he asked me he said do you mind if she speaks I said no I said let her do as many sessions as she wants <laughs> so Beverly and I have been really really good friends for a long time now uh, we met in South Africa and because uh, I was going over doing quite a few meetings there during that time so we really kind of met and got to know each other and then things led to one you know one thing or the, the other and then we ended up connected together in global reformers and so well, God's just doing a really really neat thing amen, amen. well uh, I know the conference is called the council of the Lord and the courts of heaven uh, and we're going to get to both as far as some of the things I'm going to share but um, I want I want you to understand just let me just say this about the council of the Lord and the courts of heaven they are two separate dimensions for a long time, I was a little bit confused on what was what and where was where and that kind of thing. In the courts of heaven, if you're dealing with an adversary. Okay, so whenever you go into that dimension in the spirit and there's an adversary, that means you're going to be, you're, you're moving in or going to be moving in the courts of heaven. Uh, uh, when you are in the counsel of the Lord, there is no adversary. There is no enemy. You're just there making decisions with God concerning something. And so we'll, we'll talk some about all of that uh, because it's very important that we recognize the dimension we're in because both have different protocols. And if you don't realize what dimension you're in, you could be operating out of the wrong protocol, which I did for years, by the way, uh, because I thought everything was a battlefield. So I was always on the battlefield. Well, I found out that it, uh, the protocol of a battlefield and the protocol of a courtroom are two different things. And so both of them are, are in a conflict, but they have different protocols that you have to operate by. Let me just let me just say this: How many of you have ever heard me teach on the course of that? Would you raise your hand? Because I'm looking at your faces and you're like, hey, "What's he talking?" About? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that gives me a real, real, real good idea of where we are. What I really felt to do tonight is I want to talk to you about. Um, um, resetting time from the courts of heaven. <coughs> because, because God wants us to learn how to reset time so that, and you're going to see this, so that uh, what the enemy has been successful in doing in disrupting, watch this, disrupting the timing of God. Because if he can disrupt the timing of God, he can throw everything out of sync. He can, throw, he can throw everything out of order and into chaos. So that what was, what was supposed to have happened does not happen. And I tell people all the time, this is my word to the church. God wants to take you out of the grind and put you into the groove. Hallelujah. You see, what happens is when he messes with the timing of God, you're going to see this in just a moment, we end up in the grind. We end up working real hard without seeing a lot produced. But when we can get back into sync, back into the timing of God, watch what happens. We end up in the groove where everything begins to flow together, everything begins to converge together, and all of a sudden we're seeing great fruitfulness from maybe even less efforts. We're seeing prosperity come. 
We're seeing influence erupt. We're seeing all sorts of things happen because of one thing. We're back in the timing of God, and the timing of God has been reset in our life. Amen? Amen. So let me just start this one. Let's look in Daniel chapter 7, and uh, verses uh, 25 uh, through 27, we want to read this. Daniel chapter 7, verses 25 through 27. Because what we have here is the Lord did the, uh, unveiling some uh, ideas of some of the tactics of the enemy. So it says here in verse 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Now let me pause right there. We would say that this is talking about the Antichrist spirit. Or the Antichrist. But in 1 John chapter 4, the Bible says that there is an Antichrist spirit already in the world. How I many of you know that is probably the biggest thing we're pushing against as a church? Yeah is the spirit of Antichrist. It's, it's manifest through Islam. It's manifest through all sorts of the, the, quite often the liberal agendas. It's manifested through all sorts of things. And we are pushing against that Antichrist spirit. It's operating in the earth today. And we feel its effects on our life. It's, it's one of those things that wants to make the Christians be silent when they ought to be standing up to the earth. See, that Antichrist spirit wants to intimidate us into silence. You can see this in Psalms 2, where that, where that in Psalms 2 it says, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That they would say they were going to cast his cords off and, and all these sort of, sort of things. And it says, For he, he said, it says that we will rise up against, against his Christ. Okay, that's Antichrist. Anything that's against Christ is Antichrist. And literally, the, 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 uh, the apostles came back from having been. Um, intimidated and tormented by the religious leaders and that was the psalm they prayed in Acts chapter 4. They prayed Psalms 2. Why? Because they realized the same spirit that had crucified Jesus, the Antichrist spirit, was coming after them. And then they wanted to intimidate them into their corner and back in asylum. And listen, the devil doesn't care if he just can just keep us in our corner. But if we ever stand up and say, no, we are here to expand the kingdom of God, to see His rulership have effect in cities, states, and nations, then that thing is going to begin to come after us. Does that make sense to you? So that's what we're dealing with here when He says, when He says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. We're just going to call that the Antichrist spirit, and, is, and shall persecute or wear out the saints of the Most High. Now watch this next thing. Shall intend to change times and law. The word times there means appointed times. Law means kingly decrees. So he says the intention of this thing is to alter the timing of God. The intention of this spirit that we're contending against, this thing that is the arch enemy of the church, is to alter the appointed times of God are the timing of God. So you're going to see how important this is in just a moment. It says, Then the saints shall be given into his hands for time and time and half a time. Now let me just pause right there. See, notice that the saints, because of the attack, are being worn out. Okay, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. See, this, this is what happens. When the enemy, watch what I'm about to say. When the enemy comes and changes timing, <coughs> and something that was supposed to have happened now doesn't happen. So now I'm going to keep going on in time without the shift occurring that was supposed to have occurred. And all of a sudden, I'm in a grind and no longer in a groove. What happens then is hope deferred begins to step, set in. Because, because there was a disruption of the timing of God in our life. We'll get more into this in just a moment. But that's what he's speaking of. That's why the Bible says here that the saints are given to his hand. But watch verse 27. But the court shall be seated. That's the court of heaven. Okay, let me just, just for those of you that might not get this. The court of heaven is in the third heaven. It's in the throne room of God. In Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, we see where the, the, the uh, throne of God was there and the multiple thrones. John saw 24 of them was there. Where there was 
Ten thousands times ten thousands, worshipers, and, and all these people are going to see the glass. And it says, and the court was seated, and the books were open. See, all that John described in Revelation 4 and 5 was the court of heaven that he was seeing into. The Bible says, now watch this, that we are seated with him in heavenly places. That's Ephesians 2 6. You are seated with him in heavenly places. Hebrews 12. 22 through 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion. Okay, that is a spiritual dimension of his presence and of his glory, and of his authority, and of his judicial system. See, when he says you have come to Mount Zion, he's not saying you got on an airplane and flew to Jerusalem. He's saying this is a spiritual dimension that the Bible is calling Zion. It is the place of, of His presence, the place of His glory. It says that we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, to God the judge of all. Now this is all this stuff. It says that we have come to the spirits of just men, made perfect, which is the cloud of great witnesses, the great cloud of witnesses. We have come to... Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What's what I'm about to say here? So the Bible says, I am seated with him in heavenly places. We know that that's true. We are seated where Jesus is in the third heaven. That even though my feet is on this carpet, in the spirit, I'm where he is. Amen. Okay, now watch. So I am seated together. But then the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, you have come. Let me just make a couple of statements. First of all, one of the biggest problems with the church is that we keep trying to get places we have already come to. <laughs> See what I mean by that? I mean that by the new birth and by what Jesus did for us by the blood, we have been positioned in the spirit realm and we need to learn to function where we've been positioned. And the Bible says we have come to all these things I just mentioned. What does that mean? It means He has seated us in the midst of all this spiritual activity. That's where we're seated. We are seated together with Him in every place. In other words, Hebrews 12, 22-24 is an expanded description of Ephesians 2.6. See, Ephesians 2.6 says we've been seated. Hebrews 12, 22-24 says this is where we've been seated. This is what we've been seated in the midst of. This is what we have come to. Yeah. Now, why am I going to the time to tell you all that? Because that's actually the courts of heaven. Amen. In Hebrews 12, 22-24, notice what it says. The blood that speaks is giving testimony. The mediator... Of Jesus is our mediator. He's operating in a legal perspective. God, the judge of all. The spirits of just men, which is the great cloud of witnesses, which the word witness means those who give judicial testimony. You see, everything that's mentioned there in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, it's legal. And the Bible says we are seated. Why are we seated there? Why have we come there? Because we are a part of all of that activity. In other words, I say all that to say this, you're a part of the court of heaven. That's what all that means. And we, we have a position that even though our feet is on this natural carpet, in the spirit, we are a part of the courts of heaven. So having said all of that, watch this. It says, but the court was seated. What does that mean? That means us. And all that other I just mentioned, that we are in the midst of the court being seated, and they, the court, shall take away his dominion, the spirit of Antichrist, to consume and destroy it forever. Amen. Notice what happens. Here's what happens. It says, if we're going to deal with the intention of the devil to disrupt timing, we're going to have to step into the courts of heaven. Because the thing... That reset timing was the courtroom was courtroom activity. That it takes courtroom activity to reset timing that Satan has disrupted. 
So we have to know how to go into the courts of heaven and get timing reset so that things can come back to the order of God that God intends. Amen? Amen? So what I believe tonight is that God wants to help us reset timing in our lives. Reset timing in a city's life. Reset timing in the state of Arizona. How about reset some timing in the nation of America? Amen. Because I promise you, America had its timing disrupted. But God right now is in the midst and in the, in the process of resetting the timing of America and getting it back in sync with His will. And we have to know how to go into the courts of heaven as His ecclesia, as His church, and see these things reset and timing reordered. Amen? Amen. So, why does the devil want to, want to disrupt the timing of God? Well, let me give you one idea in particular. He wants to disrupt the timing of God so that he can postpone his ultimate judgment. See, if he can slow things down, then he goes free for longer. See, you got to get that. The church thinks that there's a date on a calendar somewhere out there where God's going to do whatever he's going to do. That's not true. That is not true. See, the fullness of God's purposes are attached to the condition and the operation of the ecclesia of the church. Amen. See, how do you know that? Well, Jesus said he's sitting at the Father's right hand waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. Amen. Hebrews 10, 13. He's waiting for that to happen. What does that mean? That means He's waiting for us as the church to take what He did and subdue every enemy under His feet. It's not a day on a calendar out there. It is the church bringing things into divine order. Okay, let me give you another example. Remember when Jesus said to the, to the disciples, He said, when he was talking about the judgment that was going to come on Jerusalem, he said, pray that your flight not be in the wind. Remember that? See, well, now, was Jesus just being poetic, or did he really mean it? Here's what he meant. You can't stop what's coming, but you cannot change the effect it has on you. Please hear what I'm going to say. The church has a problem. We have a hyper view of his sovereignty. Well, okay, Sarah, Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. And that's what we, we tend to believe. That's not true, guys. Listen, you're going to find out before I'm through. We actually determine the timing of God and are called and set by God to reset his timing in the earth. Amen. And that what God is going to do is not a date on the calendar somewhere. It is connected to the operation of His church, of His ecclesia. Let me give you a scripture. Revelation 12, verse 12. Watch what the Bible says of Satan. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. See, what's he saying? He's saying the reason that Satan wants to disrupt timing is to lengthen and prolong his judgment that is sure. He knows it's a short time, so here's what he said. He said, if I want to stay out of the pit and out of the lake of fire and brimstone, I have got to disrupt the timing so that the church gets out of sync with the purposes of God so that it stops God's will from be, being done in earth at least for a season and at least for a time. So you've got to get this. See, I, I'm convinced that we have just come through a season of being out of sync with God. I have never in my life walked through anything like what we've walked through the last, I would say, 10 years. I mean, here's what I heard people say. Transition, transition, transition. I mean, this is what me and my wife would say. we got transition on top of our transition. 
I mean, it was not a pleasant time. I mean, it was 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. But that's the number of transition. People will see 11 everywhere. I heard sermons on 11s. See, what am I thinking? I'm saying that I believe some of that, if not a lot of that, if not even maybe all of that, was because the enemy messed with timing. And because he was able to disrupt the timing of God, everything got chaotic. Anybody live through a chaotic season? <laughs> yes! I promise you, 99% of the people in this room would say, I, live through, I have lived through a chaotic season. Well, let me suggest to you, it could have been because the devil messed with timing. He was successful in doing that. And we are now seeing God begin to reset the timing of God so that we can come back and get out of the grind and into the groove. Make sense to you? But we reset it, you'll see here before I'm through, out of the courts of heaven. So the enemy wants to disrupt it on a big scale. Because he wants to stay out of the lake that burned with fire and brimstone. Again, please hear me. It's not a date on the calendar somewhere. It's when the church fully puts into place everything Jesus died for. Amen. The devil understands if I can keep the church disrupted in the timing of God, I can stop that from happening. I may not be able to stop it forever, but I can stop it for a prolonged time and season. Wow. Wow. Okay. So let me give you some examples of where the enemy messed with timing. Because you've seen the scripture. Let me, let me just give you some ideas of where he messed with timing. Okay, first of all, in Genesis 15 and verse 13, God says to Abraham, that the nation that's going to come from him, they're going to be in bondage to another nation. We know it's Egypt for 400 years. Yeah. Remember that? That's Genesis 15, verse 13. But in Exodus 12, 40 through 41, it says that on the day Israel came out of Egypt, on the day they came out, they had been in Egypt for 430 years. Wow. So, can God not count? He told Abraham it was going to be 400 years. But when they came out, it had been 430. Yes. Wow. Yes. The enemy lengthened their captivity by 30, 30 years. Wow. He messed with timing. Now, somebody will say, oh, you know, it's not that big a deal. You've been there 400, 430. What's the big deal? <laughs> well, guess what? That's a half to a, a third to a half of a man's life. And if I'm on the cusp between of the 400 and the 430, and I've got to stay there 30 more years instead of coming out into liberty, I've got a problem with that. Here's what I, here's what I, was, here's what I tell people. Watch this. What if, let's just, let's just boil this down. What if 30 years ago in your life, or maybe 10 years ago in your life, in the timing of God, something was supposed to happen that didn't happen. Now stop and think about this. If it had have happened, what would your life be like today versus what it is? Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it was 15. Maybe it was 30 years ago. What if you were believing God for something that you felt was supposed to have happened but somehow or other, the enemy was able to disrupt it. And disrupt the timing of God surrounding your life. And so, instead of that thing happening 10, 20, 30 years ago, it didn't happen, and your life took a completely different path than what it would have taken otherwise. I'm trying to bring this down to where we live. Because I look at my own life. And I look at my life and I think, God's been faithful. 
But there were some things that I think should have happened before now. That I think the enemy was successful because of some legal issues in the spirit realm that I didn't understand that kept me out of what God wanted me to have sooner than I got it. And that if I could have had it sooner, I could have had a bigger influence, a greater influence, a longer influence than what I've been able to have. Now I'm thankful for what I have, but my question is simply this. Did the enemy disrupt timing and keep me out of something yes. my God. that God had given me to have earlier? And what kind of difference would it have made in my life? Yes. Well, i got news for you. It would have made a big difference. Yes. If I look back and say, that would have changed the course of my life if that had have happened and perhaps the order of God instead of the enemy, Satan, being able to disrupt timing. See, here's what we have to do. We have to repent. Watch this. For not understanding that he was disrupting timing and just accepting things as they were instead of challenging them in the Spirit. Amen. Because they were supposed to have been out 30 years earlier than what they actually came out. Mm -hmm. Because somehow or other, Satan was able to disrupt time. See, watch what happens again. When that happens, I promise you, hope deferred will at least try to save them. Why? Because grace is always attached to time. And there was a grace that was supposed to have come at a certain time, yeah. but because he messed with timing, it didn't come. And all of a sudden, I've been living, perhaps for years, without the level of grace on me in my life that was supposed to have been there. And so, Lord, I repent for just having accepted things the way they were. And just said, well, I guess this is what God wants. It's so easy to do if you're not able to discern in the Spirit what it is God's up to. And challenge things the enemy is doing because what he's seeking. I'm telling you, as I've looked at this in preachers, I'm telling you, this is one of the big things he uses. He wants to disrupt time. So here's what happens. When he disrupts time, some people just give up and quit. That's right. Others, they've just got such willpower that they just push through the door. <coughs> trying to somehow or other get there. Others just go into a realm of existence. But it's, it's because there's been an interruption in the time of your life. So that's the first thing this, that, that, that I see about this. Let me give you a second one. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years longer than was originally determined. Numbers 14, verses 33 through 20, uh, 34. It says that Israel, because the 12, the 10 spies, excuse me, came back with an evil report that God sentenced them to a year for Every day they, they were in the will, they were in, in the Canaan land, the spies were in Canaan. So they were there for 40. And so God said, You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Because they came back with an evil report. They came back with an evil report. Now you've got to understand, 10 is the number of government. And whenever that group of people, those 10 spies, released a wrong testimony, God rendered a verdict based on their testimony. That's, right on, God. That's exactly what happened. That's what happened. And ten book, spies, ten spies, please hear this, determined the destiny of a nation for 40 years. My God. My God. Because they gave a wrong report. Jesus. Here's what I want you to hear. They prophesied the wrong thing. We need to be very careful while we're prophesying. 
Because when those ten prophesied the wrong thing, it caused the timing of God for a nation to be disrupted. When the church in a nation prophesies the wrong thing, it will cause the timing of God to be disrupted in that nation. So we need to repent for all the times we prophesied the wrong word and all the times we believed the wrong word that was prophesied. We need to take a, a, a responsibility for that and say, Lord, forgive us as the church for having prophesied the wrong thing. Because I'm telling you, some of the biggest problems we have is because of a wrong word coming out of the church. And if we could repent... Watch this. We can begin the process of resetting the timing of God. Because I'm telling you, there are cities, states, nations that are out of the timing of God because the church in it is releasing the wrong word. So we have to repent as the church. And say, Lord, we want to repent for our evil report. For our negativity. For our pessimism. Watch this. For saying you wanted to judge when you actually wanted to show mercy. See, the Lord told me, He told me to go into the courts of heaven over the election. I don't even go into all the stories. But He told me, He said, as you go into the courts, you cry for mercy. Yes, sir. You cry for mercy. Because God said, I'm looking for somebody to give me a legal right to be merciful to America. People are saying, I want to judge it. See, we have to repent for all of that. Because we've allowed a disruption in the timing of God because of the report that the church has been giving in the spirit realm to God. I remember one time we were in the, in, in the courts of heaven and we were actually trying to see the drought in California be broken. And this is what the seers saw. They saw prophets prophesying judgment over California. Wow. And it was the word of the prophets prophesying judgment that the enemy was taking and building a case against California to shut up the heavens so it wouldn't rain. Wow. So we had begun to repent for all the words of judgment this sound is so spiritual. <laughs> but they're actually out of a out of a, a heart that's not releasing the right word. Listen, you gotta know you you look at the guy that believes in repentance. I believe in repentance. But I also know that God's merciful. Yes. And many times we are prophesying things that the enemy is taking. And watch this. The higher the gift level of a, of a prophetic prop, of a, of, a, of, a, of a seer or a prophet, the more the enemy takes their words and builds cases against whatever they're prophesying to in the course of heaven. And, he, and, God, and the enemy says to God, even your own person that you gave authority to, even they say this about that. And it gives the enemy a legal right to take those words and build cases that allow negative things to happen and disrupt the timing of God. I believe that God's saying, somebody prophesy the word. That will allow mercy to be shown. Yeah, we need repentance. But it's the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. Number three. The restoration of the temple and of Israel was postponed for at least 12 years, if not 17. In Haggai, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. The house of God is not being built. Because they say it's not time to build the house of God. Because, because 
they had come back with all the resources to build a house. Watch this. But they had stopped building the house and everything had been in a standstill as far as the restoration process for at least 12 years. And the enemy had disrupted timing. Now we get a clue to what he used to disrupt timing. In Zechariah chapter 5, because Zechariah was one of the prophets that prophesied during this period, Zechariah sees a scroll coming out of heaven. And it's flying. And on one side is a judgment against thieves, and on the other side is a judgment against perjurers or liars. Well, see, what had happened was there had been those who sent word back to a tax for us and had said to him, if you let this, if you let this, this house be built, this, this city be rebuilt, if you let it be rebuilt, he said, here's what he said. He said, they're going to rebel against you and you'll have no more rule. And it was a lie. That was not the intent. But it was a lie. And our tax trust released a decree that said, stop the building. Stop the restoration process. Well, when that happened, the Jews that had come back to build, they took the resources that had been sent back with them to build the house of God, and they began to build their own houses. So they stole the resources of God, misappropriated them, and used them to build their house rather than the house of God. And so when the Bible says that there was a judgment coming against thieves and perjurers, the judgment against the liars were those who had propagated the lie that they would rebel. The, 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 the judgment against uh, thieves were those who had stole the resources and not used them to build the house of God, but they built their own house. See, those two sins had allowed the enemy a legal right to disrupt timing. To disrupt the timing. So if we're guilty of taking the resources that God said, it may have been in your hand, but it was for my purposes. It was not meant for your house, it was meant for mine. Then we should repent. Okay? If we have believed the lies, and allow that to cause us to stop building. We must repent. Because the enemy uses those two things in the court of heaven to disrupt time. Amen? Amen? Okay, let me give you one more in regards to that. He said, man, I think I've had time to disrupt you in my life. Well, let me just tell you this. You're in good company. <laughs> Because in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, watch what it says. It says, Paul said, Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. My God. Paul said, Satan disrupted time. Jesus. He said, I was supposed to have been to you, Thessalonians, a long time ago, but at least twice, Satan messed with timing and kept me from getting to you. So, listen, if it can happen to the Apostle Paul, I promise you it can happen to you. I promise you that. Because I'm telling you, the more I look at this, the more I am convinced that this is a huge thing that the enemy uses to thwart God's purposes and plans and bring frustration to the people of God. And we need to go know how to go into the courts of heaven and reset the timing of God. Amen. So that we can get out of the grind and into the group. Amen? Amen. Amen. I was just telling some guys the other day in California. Somehow or another, God's been gracious and I've been able to do this. I mean, I don't know if God looked at the angels and said, somebody please go help the boy. Or, well, <laughs> but somehow or another, I've been able to receive the retirement of God reset. After a long season of being in transition. <laughs> That's our spiritual word for messed up timing. We're in transition. <laughs> It's true. Where are you, brother? I'm in transition. 
God wants to get us, get the timing where he's at. See, see, not too long ago, I had this dream. Well, we had a conference. It was a really great conference. It was like, in fact, it was last February. And about a month after that conference, maybe a little less than that, I have this dream and I meet Dutch. She's Dutch and I are really good friends. And in my dream, I meet Dutch in an airport. And Dutch looks at me in the airport and he says, Robert, how was the conference? And I, in the dream, I said, Dutch, it was phenomenal. And I started telling you some of the things that happened. I didn't tell him all, everything. Because I remember thinking in a dream, if I tell him everything that really happened, it'll make him feel bad because his wasn't as good as mine. <laughs> And I said, it's phenomenal, Dutch. And Dutch stops, and he looks at me. And he takes his fingers, and he taps his watch. And he says, Robert, you're in the center, the middle of the timing of God. And he begins to prophesy some other things. Okay, so he says these things to me. Two weeks later, I'm in Switzerland. And my phone buzzes, text message, and I look, and it's from Dutch. Now, this is real. The other was a dream. And in the text, Dutch says, Robert, I was, I was just sitting and I suddenly felt the love of the Father for you. Oh, wow. And the Lord wants you to know you're in the middle of this time. Yeah. And I, he literally prophesied to me by text what I had seen him prophesy to me in a dream. Amen. So I said, I don't know how I did it. Per se, but we reset the timing of God yeah. and what? Got out of transition and into the timing of God. I was just telling you guys, I had a dream just last night. I had a dream last night that, that um, well, I'll just tell you, I had, I had this dream last night that, that I encountered Ruth Heflin in the cloud of witnesses. And she began to speak over my life. And somebody spoke up while she's speaking over my life and said, Hey, but what about us? And she, in the dream, looked at them and said, It's Robert's turn. She literally said in the dream with, with like determination and like, You're not going to mess this up. It's not about you now. It's Robert's turn. Timing. He wants us to know how to do this. So let me let me show you this real quickly. How do we reset timing? All right. Okay, number one, we have to go to the court of heaven. Yes. We have to do that. Daniel 7, 25 to 26. His intention is to disrupt timing. It says, but the court shall be seated. Amen. So the resetting of time is connected to the court of heaven. You have to go in and you have to deal with the things that have allowed the timing to be messed up in the first place. And we've talked about some of them. Stealing the resources. Believing the lies. Speaking the wrong report. Some of those things that we've covered. And any other thing the Holy Spirit would reveal. We have to step into the course and we have to be willing to repent and say, Lord, any way I've resisted your will that allowed the enemy a legal right to mess with the timing of God, I repent. That's good. For myself, for my city, for my state, even for my nation. Lord, would you be merciful and bring us back into the timing of God. But we're going to have to do that in the courts of heaven. Number two, we have to repent. We have to repent. Listen, listen. If you're gonna if you're gonna undo the case in the courts that's allowed that's allowed him to mess with timing in the first place, you're gonna have to repent. Yeah. Because the scripture says that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. The way we use the blood is through repentance. Yes, See, when I repent, I am agreeing with what the blood is saying. 
Because Hebrews 12, 24 says the blood speaks. Okay, I need to agree with what the blood saying. I do that by bringing myself into agreement through repentance. And agree with what the blood is saying so that every case against me is dissolved. So you've got to understand, the blood grants God the legal right to forgive you. Amen. That's what the blood does. Amen. God can't just forgive. He has to have a legal right to forgive. And the blood of Jesus gives him that right. Thank you, Jesus. That's what the blood does. But watch this. The blood is speaking. Yes. Not in spoken. It's still prophesying today. Yes. So we need to say, Lord, open my ears to hear what the blood says. So that I can come into an agreement with it. And repent wherever and how and where you repent. But I just feel like to say this. In the middle of that, don't let the enemy get you stuck in repentance. <laughs> because if you have repented for something, but you constantly are repenting for the same thing over and over, it's because the enemy is going to try to get you stuck in repentance. See, this is what he, if he can't keep you out of repentance, he'll try to get you stuck in repentance. <laughs> so that you never move past repentance and get the benefit of what Jesus died for you to have. You see, in my bloodline, when I had to deal with issues in my bloodline, one of the big issues I had to deal with in my bloodline was, was violence. We obviously came from a very violent history from a Scottish descent. Found out that Henderson, literally, we were a clan that they put around the borders of, of, of Scotland to keep other nations out because we were such vicious warriors. So every time I would start to cleanse my bloodline with a seer gift, they would never want they see violence. So the last time we started doing this, the seer gift was better. Actually, she said, I see that violence thing again. And I thought, how many more times am I going to have to repent for the violence in my bloodline? And, and we discussed it, and she said, that really was the one that said this. She said, how about we call into record in the courts your previous repentance? Because there's a record of my repentance in heaven. Just like there is for you. Guess what happened? When we, I didn't repent anymore. We called into record my previous repentance that was recorded in heaven, yes. in the court, and when we did, it was enough to silence the accuser. Yes. He could not use that against me yes. anymore. Yes. Because I said, I am not. Nice. Because I watched the enemy do this. I watched him make us like a dog chasing our tail when it comes to trying to deal with his repentance. I believe in repentance, but I also know that he'll try to stick you in repentance bring shame and condemnation and you don't need to let him do that to you. But we do need to repent. For anything that we have done or that's been done in our bloodline that's allowing the devil the right to disrupt time. Okay? Number three. We should know we, just two more, we should know we are instrumental. I love this. 2 Peter 3, 10-12. It talks about the day of the Lord. It talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus. It talks about the, the, the uh, elements melting with fervent heat. And it says, seeing that these things are going to happen, what, what kind of people are we to be? But then it says this, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Yes. That word hastening there, it means to speed it up. Mm. So watch. God says the timing of the coming of the Lord is connected to the state of the church. <laughs> Not on the date on the calendar. So God says, I commission you, I commission you to speed up the coming of the Lord. 
by becoming the church, the ecclesia, that is taking his authority and beginning to rule and reign and bringing every enemy under his feet. Amen. That's what we're here to do. And the Bible says if the church will do that, guess what's going to happen? We are going to hasten the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus. We set time in it. We can reset the timing of God. Now, having said that, the last one. Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. Joel says, so I shall, Joel prophesied this. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. So God says, I'm going to restore the years. Now watch this. When he says he's going to restore the years, that does not mean that he's going to somehow or another move us back in 2016 to 2010. It's not going to happen. Now, I know there are some times, and I have some friends, and I know some people, that they've literally seen time move in maybe minutes or hours, perhaps, like the sun moved back in the days of Joshua. But, I, but we're not talking about we're going to go from 2016 back to 2010 and start over again. It's not going to happen. So what's he mean when he says, I'm going to give you back the years that have been consumed? He's not talking about the years. He's talking about the productivity of the years. He's saying, I'm going to give you back what was lost. That, that instead of it taking six years to get six years of harvest, I'll give you six years of harvest in two years. I will speed things up so that what you missed and what you lost is called up. See, you're getting this. See, see, for instance, in my own life, Mary and I have raised six children. Kids are expensive to raise. Come on now. Amen. We've been married for 39 years. We had no retirement. Wow. I've been in ministry my whole life. We've been doing good to put food on the table. But I'm telling you, in the last two years, we have watched God bring substantial amounts of wealth into our hands so that if I was to die today, Mary would be okay. And it's not over yet. Yeah. Now here's my prayer. Lord, make me a good steward. Yes. But God, in a matter of a few years, has restored to me what I didn't have for 30 years. Are you getting this? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to make you think something of me. I'm saying that as an example. But we all understand that if we get the timing of God reset, there can be great fruitfulness that shall begin to come on a scale and on a level that we can't even imagine. That God just causes blessing and fruitfulness and prosperity to come. That the years of, of, of productivity are restored. Amen. The little the literal years. I mean, yeah, he can add years to our life, but the, yeah. the literal years, we're not going to go back to 2010. Right. But watch this. He can cause the productivity to come. And all of a sudden, what we lost, and maybe what we thought was gone forever, begins to be restored in a very short period of time. Amen. Why? Because time is going to set. Because watch this. When you're in the timing of God, yes. great prosperity and fruitfulness come. Just think about Peter. When he fished all night and lived five and caught nothing. That's right. He caught nothing. He was an experienced fisherman. He caught nothing. And yet Jesus says to him, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And he reluctantly obeyed the Lord and him. And only let down a net. But he, they caught such a great catch 
that had filled all the boats. See, listen, oh, that was souls. No, that was money. That wasn't souls. That was money. Fish rent money. He was going to take those to the market and sell them, and he was going to go home with some money. Some people say that if he'd have fully obeyed the Lord, he would have financed his ministry forever. Wow. But he did. He only done a net when the Lord said, let down multiples of nets. Mm. And because of that, the net broke. My God. That's why it broke, because he simply didn't believe the Lord. He humored the Lord. Wow. But the point is, the word of the Lord set timing in order. And when he moved in the timing of God, what had not happened the night before, just a few hours later, happened on a great scale. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. God wants to reset time. Yes. God wants to bring us. See, now watch this. When it talks, there's one more thought. When it says, when it says that He brings restoration to the productivity of years, why is that? Because when you get out of the timing of God, this is, now this is universal. When the enemy disrupts time, watch what happens. Loss always occurs. That's what makes it so painful. We lose something we were supposed to have happened. We lose something that was supposed to have happened that didn't happen. Loss always occurs. So God wants to bring us back to the timing he wants to reset his timing in the course of heaven so that we can see the fruitfulness of God, the blessing of God. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, as a nation, God's moving us there. Yes. God wants to move us there as cities. He wants to move us there as states. He wants to move us there as families, yes. as people. He wants to move. See, it's time to get out of transition. Yes. <laughs> Which is a code word. <laughs> Satan has messed with time. Now you gotta say, I do believe in transition. I do. But I'm telling you, this transition has been too long. You said, well, how do you know it's been too long? Because when people are dying prematurely, yeah. financial ruin is coming, families are falling apart, yeah. it's, not, it's, not it's not the transition of God anymore. There's demonic things that are taking advantage of something being out of timing. And God said, I want to make a shifting, I want to reset timing in the courts of heaven. Amen? Amen. So, if you say, Amen, I need some of that, would you stand up with me? Yeah, I realize what time it is. I'm looking at the clock now. Right Here's what I want us to do, though. I want us to step in the court of heaven. You said, well, how are we going to do that? I'm going to help you, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask for the courts of heaven to open. And, and there, uh, it is like, we know I'm there. The courts of heaven are going to open. And when they open, we need to, we need to by faith, move in there um, as individuals and just believe God, and families, and believe God for the timing to be reset. Amen. So I need for you just to be in agreement and spirit of unity here. So Father, Lord Jesus, I just want to say to you right now that we want to thank you for who you are and for all that you do. And I'm asking, Lord, right now, that the court of heaven, the court of heaven would just open, even as we're standing here in your presence. Thank you. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your presence. See, even as I said that I just saw the gates and doors of the court just begin to open. Thank you, Lord, for your graciousness. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. Lord, that you are giving us invitation to come into your courts. Step into your presence even now. See, Lord, your will done. See, timing reset. And here's what I sense. I sense that even as we begin to step into the courts, I sense, I literally sense the vengeance of the Lord to do this. 
that the Lord has been waiting for a people to come before Him that He might do this in their behalf. Because as much as people have been weary and, and tired because they've been out of the timing, the timing has been messed up, the Lord has been waiting, literally waiting, for a people to come and to petition Him for Him to be able to render judgments against the devil's works and to see the timing, his timing, reset even in our lives. So, Lord, even as we're just standing here now, we just step by faith into the courts of heaven. I just, I just step before you. I just step into your presence, Lord Jesus, into your place of dwelling. And even as we come into this place, Lord, now, we just want to, we want to adore you, we want to worship you, and we want to stand before you, Lord. And Lord, we want to just, even now, just say, we are here. We are here, Lord. Yeah, yeah, Lord. To ask of you to, ask to of reset tithing to reset. Lord, even in our life and even in our family. Lord, that there would be timing that would be reset. Be merciful to us, Lord. That you would be kind to us, Lord. That your mercies would come, Lord. Lord, even over us, Lord. Even over us as individuals. Even over us as families, Lord God. Lord, that your mercies would come. Even over us as cities. As a state, Lord, and your mercy would come even over us as a nation, Lord. Lord, we want to ask as we stand before you, Lord Jesus, even in your courts, Lord, Lord, that there would be a resetting of timing. And everything the enemy has stolen, oh God, everything that he has taken away because he was able to disrupt your timing, oh God. And out of that disruption, he was able to steal and to take away. Lord, I'm going to ask you right now that timing would be reset in Jesus' name and that restoration would come, Lord, even to your people, even as we would stand before your courts, Lord, that there would be a restoring, a restoring of you by your power and by your spirit, Lord Jesus. Lord, I say that you would do this for your sake. Because that's what I see. It's okay for us to ask, but here's what the Lord said. Ask it for my sake. Yeah. And here's what you need to do. You need to say, Lord, Lord, I'm going to lay aside my own desire for my own family. And I'm going to ask for a resetting of time. Even for, the, for your sake, Lord. For the sake of your purposes being done in the earth. For your word said that if I would seek the kingdom of God first, everything would be added. Now this is a step of faith. I want you to stop asking for yourself. And I want you to say before the courts as we stand here, Lord, for your sake let this be done. For your sake let this be done, Lord Jesus. For your sake, oh God, let this be done. Let this be done for your sake, Lord. That you would rise in judgment against the powers of the adversary, against the powers of the devil, oh God. And you would, you would be puked him for your sake, Lord Jesus. For your sake, oh God. That timing might be reset for your purposes to be done, even in the earth, Lord, that your purposes will be done. That your purposes will be done in the earth, Lord Jesus. That your purposes will be done in the, in this, in the Lord, even here in Phoenix, oh God. Even here in Arizona, oh God. The Lord, even in the nation of America, oh God. And even other nations, Lord. We just ask, Lord, for your sake that you would do this, Lord Jesus. That there would be judgments and verdicts against the powers of darkness, Lord. That they that be. Lord, disrupted tithing. Lord, I want to ask that there would even be verdicts and judgments against the spirit of Antichrist. Lord Jesus, that you would come to do this, Lord. By your mercy and by your kindness, Lord. Even as we stand before you. Even as we stand before you. In your presence, In your presence, Lord. We're asking you that no flesh would glory in your presence. We're asking you
Lord, we were asking for your, but here's what I can see as if we were asking for your sake in Phoenix, Lord. In Phoenix, that you would rise and judge everything that's disrupted the time of God in this city. That has tried to disrupt what you would desire to do, that has even prolonged and lengthened the time of waiting. I'm asking, Lord, for your purposes to be done in this city, Lord Jesus. Even in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm asking that no flesh would glory in your presence. I'm asking, Lord, that every leader in every church that is tried to take supremacy, O God, and try to be the head with all you wanted, for us, for us to just serve. And we ask you to do it in We ask that you would bring up a story in the city. And we ask, Father, for your divine purposes done in Phoenix, Arizona, Lord. That every disruption of time, every length of time, what I believe really has even resulted in decades of things that were supposed to have happened decades ago that did not happen. Lord, that you would not have pursued. And, us. and you would cause, Lord, for your sake, for your sake, Lord, things to be set into order, the church to come to the place that you've ordained it to come to. But I pray that you would do this even in Phoenix, Arizona, oh God. Even in Phoenix, Arizona, that it would be God, Lord. So I thank you for that, even as we stand before you in the courts of heaven. In the courts of heaven, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing this. But what I keep sensing is even as we've just done that, is that simple little thing. Here's what I felt. That it caused you a will to put his his ahead of yours. God says, now ask me for yours. That I would be set tight. Even in your own life and even in your own family. That the situations with your children, that literally there's children that because tiny got messed up, they went off with wrong direction. That children would be brought back to all. When you would come, you would have you would already be able to Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Even as we stand in your courts. Lord, where there's been health issues, but healing now come, Lord Jesus. Lord, healing now come, Lord. Where there's been financial issues, let breakthroughs come, Lord. Father, let timing be reset and timing be reordered. Thank you for doing this, Lord. Lord, right here in Phoenix, Arizona, oh God. Right here in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this, Lord. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this.